Okay, well, I guess I'll get started then. So, hello everyone. Um, my name's Alex Speller, and um, you may recognise me from IRC if you are on IRC ever. Um, I'm pretty much always in the EmberJS channel. Um, so, I wanted to talk about query params in. Uh, oh, that's better. I wanted to talk about query params in the Ember router, which um, I'd like to I'd be interested to see a show of hands. Who actually knows that Ember supports query params natively now? So it's 1.3 allegedly, but or Canary, <laughs> but um, it is kind of. Um, so, I mean, some people are, are obviously unaware that it's there at all. So. It's coming very shortly, and if you use Canary, which I mean, you know, if you're using Ember, you're probably not that averse to, to new technologies um, and living on the edge, then you can use it now, and it's there and stable. So um, I'm going to kind of go over that. So I think that when you're trying to solve a problem, um, you know, it's it's easy to just you know think you need query params. Why do you actually need them? Well, because you're a web developer and you're used to using query params and stuff. So I think it's good to actually be explicit about the problem that you want to solve and about the pain that you're trying to solve. So there's got to be like a reason to to do it rather than you know other than just um, other than just query params being something that you're used to. So what is that reason? So there's in Ember that you can deal with lots of application state. I mean, in essence, the core of Ember is uh, arguably the router, and the router is a big state machine. And um, it used to be clearer that it was a big state machine, but um, it's kind of been hidden a bit behind the DSL. But at its core, um, the router is the, the broker between your application state and the rest of the world. So this is um, an application you might have seen called Ember Beats. It actually it's a nice drum machine. You can you know, make loads of nice drum beats and play with it. Um, it's really fun. You should go and play with it, go Google it, and um, have a go. But the, the thing I'm trying to illustrate is that um, you can store a hell of a lot in the URL using normal root segments. So, oh, that's not right. Um, so this looks like a base64 encoded string, which contains the whole song. Um, it's probably just some kind of JSON structure that's been encoded with a base64. So you don't have to just store a numeric or textual ID there. You can have a massive amount of state in your um, your URL. So you'd think that you know you actually don't really need query params because you could just serialize a JSON object that represented loads of things rather than just an ID. Yeah, so that kind of breaks down if it's optional. So if you wanted to kind of sort a list, for example, um, you're going to need to have two, uh, two routes and one of them which has params and one which doesn't. And these would have to actually be, I mean, this syntax is actually wrong. You'd have to name them separately and they'd have different names. You'd probably have to do something horrible with subclassing roots. It just wouldn't be very nice. Also, what if it's controller state? Um, <coughs> so what if, um, what if you just want to uh, store something that's the way a controller displays something. A controller is something that presents uh, a model to a view. And something like sorting isn't really model state. Um, sorting is more about how you're viewing it than, than how it's stored, how the data structure is, is created. So there have been, obviously, some attempts to, to solve these problems, um, one of which is my own Ember query, um, which solved quite a lot of um, problems quite well, um, but it was horribly buggy. Uh, it was really hard to keep up to date with changes in Ember because it monkey patched a lot of stuff, and it kind of solved some problems but not others. Um, on the other side, there was Ember query params, um, and Ember query params solved sli a slightly overlapping but different set of problems, and it also solved them quite well, but it had some bugs as well, and lots of custom hacks which people have done. And you know, if you've done this, uh, either you have loads of subtle or not so subtle bugs, and it's broken in subtle ways, or I hate you for making me actually have to write this Good myself. Is this, is this the handling of query parameters? Yes, yes, or exactly. Is it the integration of the query parameters to query something, some sort of data set. No, it's it's not. So it's not to do with you can. Uh, it's not to do with querying uh, data sets. So it's just purely to handle. Yeah, so it's to handle parameters in your application URLs. Um, it's not to do with querying data stores. Ember Data has always supported query params for querying stuff on the back end, or you can use jQuery or however you want to, to load data. So query params in Ember uh, and not Ember Data 
is ambivalent to what data store you're using. You could be using uh, Ember Data, you could be using jQuery, or you could be using nothing. Um, you could have no backend data store at all, and it could have, be everything on the client side. Um, so there are query params in master. There's this horrible URL, which I'm going to leave up for a, a while, um, because Although it's merged into master, unfortunately the docs aren't merged into the website branch and there has been some, uh, some back and forth on that about um, whether or not they should be merged because it's only available behind a feature flag. Um, so this is actually a URL to the pull request which will be merged eventually, uh, hopefully soon. Um, but the docs, are, th there, are f there is full documentation to this and they will eventually be on the website as a guide. Um, I'm going to go through kind of basic examples of how to use them. Uh, it's a relatively simple API. So the main thing is that <coughs> query params are a, a routing concern. So you have to define the query parameters that your routes are going to respond to. Um, and you do that in your router.map statement. Um, you can um, define different query params for different nested routes. Um, and this kind of looks simple. It's quite easy to understand. You, you give a list um, to each resource or root of query params that are being responded to. Um, however, it does get slightly complex, and there are some slightly unexpected things because query params are global. And if you're not careful, this can kind of go really wrong for you. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to kind of go through some of the examples of how, how this can go wrong and how it can go right. So here's an example where um, your, uh, your, your uh, sorry, here's an example of the URLs that show up in the browser URL bar. And by the way, I'm just using paths here, but this does work perfectly with push date or hash URLs. Um, so it, it doesn't mean that you have to use push date. It's supported by you know older IV, IE versions if you're lumbered with those. Um, and the interesting thing here is, so the first two are probably what you'd expect. Um, you can respond to, you know, posts URL responds to sort and direction parameters as defined. Um, and the post URL, the post resource, which is the nested resource, responds to show details because that's what's expected. But you'll notice here that actually you can have all of the query params that are registered for both the child and the parent. And that happens when you're accessing the uh, the child route. So this is because in Ember, unlike server-side frameworks that, I, I mean, I certainly am, come from the server-side more than the client-side background, you may be used, to, you're probably used to one route being active at once. I mean, that's kind of the thing in Rails. You've got one route, even though the URLs are nested, you probably won't have nested resources where multiple things are active at the same time. But in Ember, it's very common to have multiple routes active at the same time. Um, and that means that query params are kind of additive among parent and child routes. Um, how do you actually access these? So there, you get new arguments in the all of the hooks. So before model, after model, um, model obviously, setup controller and render template, anywhere that this stuff is usually passed in. Um, <coughs> One gotcha if you're adding this is that um, the transition object used to be the last argument in the functions in the uh, in the hooks, but it's now um, now there's a additional query params and this actually this argument this actually varies depending on if you have query params defined for the root or not. Um, it was kind of a compromise to have a nice API which was worked out with the Huda cats. Um, I don't think this actually will really matter because I don't think it's very common to be actually using the transition object that's passed into the model hooks. Um, it was quite a recent addition anyway, <coughs> and it's very rarely used. But it, it is something to watch out for that if you define query params on a route, um, it will pass in query params transition. But if on your index route you didn't have any query params defined, it would just pass in transitions. You won't get an empty uh, query params object. Um, you can transition query params, so you just pass in a hash with the key query params as the last argument in transition to. Um, you pass in um, you know, the value for what you want them to be, um, and it sets them in the URL, it's updated. You can also use replace with the alternative to transition to if you don't want to add a state to your browser history. 
um, which obviously doesn't work in, in all cases, but it works where, where that's supported by the browser. Um, and if it's not supported by the browser, it will just be the same as if you used it um, you know, without query params, i.e. it will add a state to the history and there's just not much you can, you can do about it. Um, and it works in the link to helper. Um, so this syntax is probably going to change, unfortunately. Um, it looks like there's been slightly too many issues with query params clobbering link view um, properties. So if you were to have a query param called active, for example, that will break everything because link view has an active property which it uses to set the CSS class. Um, I think another one was state. So if you have a query param, param called state and pass it into a link to helper, there's an infinite loop because state is actually relied on as a property <laughs> for link view. So uh, that will probably be changed to something like query direction equals ASCII. You know, there'll probably be some kind of convention as to the naming when you pass it into the link, the link to helper. Um, and there, there's just a link to it. I, I, I will be kind of uh, tweeting my slides and maybe passing them on to someone to post on the meetup group or something so that if anyone wants to get to these links without copying them down now, you'll be able to. But this is the issue where this problem's discussed uh, and the, re the re resolution will uh, come into eventually. Um, so another slightly unexpected thing maybe, if you're not used to it, is query parameters are sticky. So let's say you're currently on a URL and you've got sort param set and then you transition the direction parameter, um, the sort param will stay the same as what it was. Um, and this lets you um, this lets you kind of build up stuff additively. So obviously, if you change the sort direction from a link, you probably don't want to then clear the actual value that's sorted by. So it lets you kind of have lots of links to uh, to build up a state from from stuff rather than having to have every link have every query param explicitly listed. Um, and so that's the same with the the link to helper, obviously. Um, when you do want to query, clear query params, you just pass in false, um, and they're cleared. Um, that's quite so. That's quite simple and expected. Same with the the link to helper, um, passing in false queers, clears them. Boolean query params are uh, don't actually have a value. So if you pass in true as a value to a query param, it doesn't get set as um, you know param equals true, it's just present without um, an equals in it. Um, and this allows, um, it allows you to do much simpler logic in your uh, root hooks because obviously if it was true or false and that or zero or one or whatever convention you might choose, um, they both evaluate truthy in JavaScript. So it lets you just do if params dot is showing details and it will just work okay because it will be either null or true. Um, so, and it will actually be Boolean true. It won't just be a string true. It will be tr actual Boolean true. Um, this is kind of a gotcha. Um, and this isn't a query params gotcha. This is an Ember gotcha, but it's actually relatively not well known. Um, and the observer's guide has only recently been improved. So if you haven't read the, the guide to observers in the last like two or three weeks, go back and read it because um, there's like, almost everyone misunderstands observers. It took me like a year of using Ember until I actually realized um, some really big gotchas about observers and I was like, oh, I've got loads of bugs in my application. No wonder that's happening. Um, so that's buggy. This is the solution to it. Um, you In observers, you should generally wrap your actual logic in an ember.run.once um, uh, function. So this will um, this will do pretty much the same thing, except it won't break horribly um, when you try and transition to this route. Um, this, I mean, query params happens to expose this really badly, and that is because this observer will fire as the route is set up, and at that point you're in the middle of a transition, and it will try and cancel the current transition and retransition into what you've just transitioned to. So it's kind of horrible. Um, I'll just try and kind of explain why that is very briefly. Observers are synchronous, um, and whereas computer properties, properties generally aren't. Um, so as soon as this value changes, um, your observer will be called. So as soon as checked value changes 
at all. Your observer will be called straight away. Um, and that means that bindings might not have synced. If you're in a transition, the transition won't have completed. Um, if you're observing multiple properties, then your observer will be called multiple times. So if you're observing three properties and they all change in the same run loop, your observer will get called three times and the properties will be different each of those three times until the final time it's finally updated and the properties are the values that you would expect them to be. So this is in the, in the observer guide and there's some other stuff in there as well that's new about them. Observers are kind of one of the things in, in Ember that are much more complex than it looks at first glance. So go and check that out. Um, Another thing is that query params are global. And there was quite a lot of discussion about this um, on Discuss um, during the implementation phase. And there were some proposed solutions where there was some kind of weird syntax that didn't look like query params. So like um, Tim Berners-Lee pr proposed matrix params, which is kind of like query params in path segments separated by semicolons. Um, but it was decided that it just kind of looked too weird, and people think it will be think people think it's weird. Um, it also breaks like um, some uh, URL um, parsing stuff, like it, you end up with loads of broken links on the web because they don't expect semicolons to be in them. Um, so it was decided to, to just deal with this fact that they're global and and not have like some weird syntax. Um, and that means that you know if you have two paginated resources, this is one that was actually an issue recently on, on GitHub. If you have two paginated resources and you call both of the params page, <coughs> even though they're not nested, if you go to kind of like page four of the posts and then click a link to comments, you'll be, end up on page four of the comments. Um, so essentially, because they're global, each query param represents a part of application state. And if you want it to represent two different application states, um, then you have to use different names for them, <coughs> which is it's not that bad. It's not that bad, but it, it's something that might trip you up. And if you really, really want both of the params to be called page, just for your, you want because you want your URLs to look like that, then you may kind of be able to hack around it with like redirects, but it's going to be really ugly. Um, I don't know why that's happened. So what's to do? Um, model query params versus control, control query params. So this is something I've been meaning to work on, haven't got around to yet, but. Currently, all query params are expected to be model query params. And what I mean by that is that query params are treated very much the same as dynamic segments in your roots. So they're treated as if they represent the model and state of the model. And if you transition query params, it's going to hit your model hook again, um, you know, if, if, if appropriate. So if the query param affects the right root and it's the the top of the tree of roots that change. So if so but basically if a change to that dynamic segment would have hit the model hook, the query params will hit the model hook. And this is generally fine but slightly inefficient. And what I mean by that is that um, if you could have sorted on the client side, or if you can sort on the client side, that's kind of a common, common use case. You've got a list and it's already loaded. It will still hit your model hook and it will load the list again from the server, unless you manually cache it. Um, there's going to be some work done to flag that a query param affects only client state. And what that means is the model hook will only be hit the first time, and then you can change the, change the state on the client side without hitting the server again. Um, you can cache this relatively easily just using some kind of you know, hash dictionary object in your root, um, but it's, it, it will be built in in the future and it will be slightly nicer in API terms. Um, a nicer way to bind query params to control the state, so a declarative way of doing the observer thing I was showing you earlier. I think that's probably the most common use case, to be honest, is um, binding to controller state. So you, you will want your query params to directly map to stuff on the controller. And um, at the moment, you have to assign it in. You have to set it in your one of your root hooks. And then you have to, um, you have to bind and have an observer on the controller to set it back to the query params. So it would be nice to have kind of you know, a one word API for that to, to do it simply. Um, at the moment, you can't specify query params for application root. Um, it's just because application root isn't defined in your app.router.map um, state. So there's no, there's no real big reason that this is not possible. It's actually quite an easy implementation, but the API is just not there. Um, 
you can mitigate this either by um, wrapping you uh, basically by wrapping all of your roots inside a parent resource, but that's kind of not great if you don't want to do that. It, it doesn't have to affect your URLs because your parent resource that you wrap everything in can have a path of uh, slash, but um, it does mean that the names of your, your all your child root will have to change appropriately. Um, and really, who knows? So. One of the great things that I love about Ember is the fact that um, it's really aggressive about seeing real-world usage and um, kind of evolving best practices and wrapping those into the framework. <coughs> so once this is out for a while and people start using it, hopefully common patterns are going to be seen and um, uh, you know adopted as best practices in the framework. Um, so I guess that's really it. Um, kind of my takeaways from doing this. So this is kind of the first time I've I've really dived into. Uh, contributing to Ember. I'd done kind of a few very small pull requests before and this kind of touched everything. So there's kind of a few micro libs in, in Ember. There's the um, uh, there's the router.js uh, router lib, which is you know usable without Ember for handling all the routing stuff. And there's root recognizer, which is uh, a dependency of router.js. And that actually handles kind of like the parsing stuff, um, for parsing URLs and stuff. And um, it, you know, routing is hard in general. Um, nested routing is particularly hard. Synchronous nested routing is even harder. But Ember's router handles this in a really, really good way. Um, I don't think I've, you know, I certainly haven't seen any other frameworks really tackling this in such depth. Um, and the problem is that it's actually, oh, I haven't actually finished it. Um, the problem is that it's really, it's really hard to actually understand it. Um, I, I feel like it took like a month of hacking on the router for me to actually get it. So it's really, really worth digging into the code. Um, it's readable and um, it's it's not actually that big. Um, if you go and read like the main file in router.js, you will like, instantly level up your Ember programming because the router is like really the center of everything. Um, and that's it. So. Go and use query params and enjoy. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, yeah. uh, do you know if there's uh, like an example small application that, that uses uh, query params? Um, so there is. What is there? I actually did a JS fiddle, which was posted on the original pull request, but that's not going to be that easy to. It's, it's PR3182. I know this because I've like <laughs> been to it like a million times. Um, I do actually have one, um, and I was uh, I kind of have it on my laptop, but um, I can put it up somewhere and tweet it, and or uh, put it somewhere else. So um, I'll wherever I put it, I will make sure I send it to the organisers, and they can post it somewhere everyone can see it. But I I do have something. It's the Ember, the Tompster mail thing that's on the Ember.js homepage, but with sorting, basically. So, uh, um, yeah, I'll post that if you're interested. Um, I had one about the, the sticky grams. Um, if the route changes, I take it, is that sticky or is that not sticky at that point? So if you go from post to uh, comments, for example, it, would it still make the grams sticky? Yes, it would. Um, it, it, so it's it's... Once you start using it, 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 it kind of makes sense. But so if they if posts and comments both have a param named page, uh, they both have the same param, then right. it will stick between the two. <laughs> if you if they don't have a param name, if they have differently named params, they will stick to the individual roots. So you'll go back to um, posts, and it will it will store that page in the the root state. You go back to comments, and it will go back to the page you were on previously, unless you explicitly link to um, or transition to uh, a uh, with the query param equal, equal to false, which will then clear it. So, uh, if you're using it for pagination, like m a lot of your links, like maybe the you know the the link to posts would probably have page equals false in it, so that it always links to the first page or page equals one, whatever. Yes. Say if every time you navigate away from a bigger chunk of your site, you need to clear down all the query parameters you're using in that chunk. Um, every outgoing link. If appropriate. Um, so. I mean, with pagination, yes, you probably would want to do it every time, but um, often you would want to store that. So if like you have a specific view or tab open, maybe that that would be kind of stored in the state, and you'd have to clear that if you wanted to not link to, not go back to that state. The, um, 
the will transition event that seems like a you can yeah you could use well well transition um you can do it in setup controllers so if you wanted to clear them down in setup controller you could then retransition out of that um i think oh, actually maybe that would be hard um probably will transition is, is the best way to do it um or linking to the query parameter equal to false um it, it usually makes sense, but obviously for some some stuff it can can get annoying if you really want to clear everything. Um, but you can just link to query params equals false, and that clears all of them. So that's probably the easiest way if you want to reset your state when you re-enter a root. Is there a reason that like query params are separated just from general sort of grounds? Um, so I mean, it, th you can do quite a lot of this with. You know, normal params with um, dynamic segments. Um, it's really, um, it's really much more useful for controller state um, than the model state. So, it, it's really, although it's slightly inefficient right at the moment, um, if you have you know some part that's controller state and some parts that's model state, you it almost always makes sense to uh, use the controller state as query params, um, and this is for the same root. So. Like sometimes you might use a nested root um, where the parent is the model. The parent has the model state in it as a dynamic segment, and the child has the controller state in it. Um, but I mean, essentially, there are some. There are just some cases where that's really difficult to do. Uh, roots without dynamic segments, for example, make that really, um, really difficult to do. Um, where you have the option, so. If you'd want a list of posts where you can just hit slash posts, or you can hit slash posts slash page one, for example, that means you're going to have to have like two routes, and that's going to get really annoying. So that's going to be painful. Um, it doesn't actually allow you to do anything that's completely impossible to do right now with dynamic segments, but it allows you to do a load of stuff a lot nicer. Um, that's essentially it. And eventually, it will allow you to do some stuff that's impossible. Um, but uh, to do at the moment. I think, I think the use case I, I've hit already is like, like Google Analytics wants to know about your search URL and it expects a, a parameter. Right. Um, yeah. That. And you can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's definitely um, that's definitely one one use case. Um, it's going to be a lot. It's it's just going to be a lot nicer than serializing stuff. Like if you have like so mappings one where it's like incredibly useful if you've got like that long zoom level. Like you can do that at the moment, and you can kind of serialize that, but it's just going to be a lot nicer to do that in in a way like so. It may, it's really useful in link to. So let's say you've got a map and you want to have a link that zoom in. If you do that with a dynamic segment, you're going to have to like build a controller computed property that like has the current object, but then altered with a higher zoom level, and then use that in the link to helper. This kind of lets you kind of transition and link to smaller units of application state rather than you know the current link to helpers, which require like either the new model or the entire um, dynamic segment to be passed in all in one go. So I guess that's probably actually the best way to describe it: is it kind of lets you break up your application state into uh, into small your controller state into smaller little parts that you can link to atomically rather than having to link to the whole shebang in one in one go. Um, three questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, first is um, about security. Uh, you said that the, it's pretty global what you're doing in the parameters. So, as under developers, do you need to be concerned about people perhaps uh, knowing the fact that you're using Ember and oh, by the way, you can just set global. Um, essentially, no, because. Right. Um, basically, anything that you can do on the client side, you can do. So you have to have some sort of defensive coding in there somewhere. Mm, uh, no, I mean, so it's essentially it, it, if you're building a client side application, you can't do any auth in it. You can't, you know, you you have to assume that you can't obf obfuscate anything or code defensively against ev anything. Like anything that's in your your source code that you send to the browser, then they can see and they can change and they can do whatever they want with. You have to do all of your auth on the server, um, and. That's just the, how client-side apps work. Yeah. So uh, it it doesn't have any impact on that. The client-side applications in general uh, are any different to basically. I can't remember my second question, but oh, my third okay. question is: Was your talk for using the technique you you suggested today, or against it? It was for. I got the impression that it was against it. 
No, it's for oh, it. Okay. Uh, so I developed this this and uh, filed the pull request for, for this. So, I mean, yeah, query params are great for, for certain use cases. Um, have you, did you remember the second one? No. OK. No. Yeah. Well, I'll be around, so ask me a few later. It might be unfair, but so you mentioned uh, tapping to the controller state. And um, do you have any sort of time frame in mind? Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, last time I was asked this, I had about a month, and that was about a month ago. <laughs> so uh, I guess I, sh I could say the same thing, but um, the the problem is that I actually don't really work on Ember much anymore. <laughs> um, I changed projects last month at work, and I'm back on a much more standard um, server-side application. So um, I have less time at work, but I do really want to get this finished um, anyway. So um, it, it's definitely something that I will look at eventually, and um, hopefully we'll get time to look at it soon. Sorry, I can't be more no, <laughs> specific. Fine. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks everyone for listening. Thanks.